All right, we're going to continue in John Calvin's um, first volume, Tracks and Letters. This is chapter one, the biography of Calvin by Theodore Beza. We left off around page 25 last time, and that's where we'll pick up today. At this time, also, he published a greatly enlarged edition of his Christian Institutes and a commentary on the Epistle to the Romans dedicated to his dear friend Simon Grenet together with a little golden treatise on the Lord's Supper, for the use of his countrymen, the French. This was afterwards translated into Latin by Galars. The subject of the Lord's Supper is here expounded with so much agility and erudition that a determination of those most unhappy controversies in which all the learned and all the good deservedly acquiesced is chiefly to be ascribed under God to that treatise. Nor had Calvin less success in bringing back many Anabaptists to the right path, and in particular two, the one, Paul Vols, to whom Erasmus had dedicated his Manual of Christian Soldier, and whom the Church of Strasbourg afterwards enjoyed as its pastor. And the other was John Storter of Lierge, who afterwards died of the plague, and whose widow, Iraleta, a grave and honorable woman, Calvin married by the advice of Bucer. There was Calvin's studies at Strasbourg until the year 1541, and this year the emperor convened a diet first at Worms and afterward at Ratisbon, for the purposes of setting up the differences in religion. This diet, agreeably to the wish of the theological consistory of Strasbourg, Calvin attended, and, as it appears, not without great advantage to the churches, especially that of his native country, and to the great delight of Master Philip Melanchthon and Gaspar Krusiger, of blessed memory. The former often called Calvin the theologian, and the latter, after a private conference with him on the subject of the supper, in which he was made acquainted with Calvin's opinion, distinctly approved of it. But the time had arrived when the Lord had determined to take pity on the Church of Geneva. Accordingly, one of the syndics, who had labored to procure the decree which the faithful pastors were ejected, so misconducted himself in the administration of the Republic that he was accused of sedition. Attempting to escape by a window, he fell, and being a large, overgrown man, was so much injured that he died a few days after. Another of them was executed for murder. Two other beings accused of misconduct themselves in a certain embassy on which they had been sent by the Republic took flight and were condemned in absence. The city, being thus rid of its filth and froth, began to long for its feral and its Calvin. That's my dogs in the backyard chasing the birds. As there seemed very little hope of getting back feral from Neuchâtel, the state turns its whole attention to Calvin and employing the meditation of Zurich, sends an embassy to Strasbourg to, abstain, to obtain the consent of the inhabitants to his return. He's expressed great reluctance to part with him. Calvin himself, although the injuries which he had received as the instigation of certain wicked men, had made no changes upon his affection for the Genovese. Yet, having an aversion to disturbances, and seeing that the Lord had blessed his ministry in the Church of Strasbourg, stated plainly that he would not return. Lucer also, as others, declared that they would have the greatest objection to part with him. The Genovese, however, persisting, Lucer came to be of the opinion that their prayers should be complied with, but he never would have obtained Calvin's consent had he not given warning of divine judgment and appealed to the example of Jonah. These things have occurred about the time when Calvin had to go to with Bucer to the Diet of Radisbon, or so it had been determined. His return was postponed, and the Genovese obtained the consent of the people of Bern, that Peter Vire of Lausanne should go for a short time and officiate at Geneva. This made Calvin the less reluctant to return, inasmuch as he was to have a colleague whose aid and advice would be the greatest use to him in restoring the church. Accordingly, after the lapse of several months, Calvin returned to, the Geneva, uh, Calvin returned to Geneva on the 13th of September, 1541. Amid the congratulations of the whole people, and especially of the Senate, who then sincerely acknowledged the singular goodness of God towards them, and who never ceased to urge the people of Strasbourg to expunge a reservation which they had made, making the return only temporary. This they at length conceded, on condition, however, that the honorary freedom of the city which they had conferred on Calvin should remain unimpaired, and that he should continue to draw yearly what they call the probant, because that's his income. The former condition... Calvin approved, but being a person who had no desire whatsoever for wealth, he could never be induced to accept the latter. 
Calvin, being thus restored at the urgent entreaty of his church, proceeded to set it in order. Seeing that the city stood greatly in need of a curb, he declared, in the first place, that he could not properly fulfill the ministry unless, along with Christian doctrine, a regular presbytery with full ecclesiastical authority were established. That's a cactus ran you here in the background. At that time, therefore, but this matter will be more fully explained further on, laws for the election of a presbytery and for the due maintenance of that order were passed agreeably to the word of God and with the consent of the citizens themselves. These laws, Satan afterward made many extraordinary attempts to abolish, but without success. Galvin also wrote a catechism in French and in Latin, not, all at, a, not at all differing in substance from the former one, but much enlarged and in the form of a question and answer. That's actually at the back of this first volume as well. This may well be termed an admirable work and has been so much approved in foreign countries that it has not only been translated into a great number of living languages, such as German, and English, Scotch, Flemish, and Spanish, but also in the Hebrew by Emmanuel Gemelius, a Christian Jew, and most elegantly into Greek by Henry Stephen. But his ordinary labors at this time were, will be seen from the following statement. During the week, he preached every alternate and lectured every third day. On Thursday, he met with the presbytery, and on Friday, attended the ordinary scripture meeting called the congregation, where he had laid he had his full share of the duty, where he had his full of the duty. That's a busy week. He also wrote most learned commentaries on several books of scripture, besides answering the enemies of religion, maintaining an extensive correspondence on matters of importance. Anyone who reads these attentively, attentively will be astonished how one man could be fit for labors so numerous and so great. That's true. He availed himself much of the aid of old Farrell and Vuret, while at the same time he was also of great service to them. This friendship and intimacy was not less hateful to the wicked than delightful to all the pious. And in truth, it was most pleasing spectacle to see and hear these three distinguished men carrying on the work of God so harmoniously, and yet differing so much from each other in a matter of their gifts. Farrell excelled in a certain sublimity of mind, uh, so that nobody could either hear his thunders without trembling, or listen to his most fervent prayers without feeling almost as if it were carried up into heaven. Uh, Vire possessed such winning eloquence that his entrance audience hung upon his lips. And Calvin never spoke without filling the mind of the hearer with the most weighty sentiments. They've often thought that a preacher compounded of the three would have been absolutely perfect. To return to Calvin, in addition to these employments, he had many others arising out of the circumstances, domestic and foreign, for the Lord so blessed his ministry that persons flocked from all parts of the Christian world some to take his advice in matters of religion, and others to hear him. Hence we have seen an Italian, an English, and finally a Spanish church at Geneva, one city seemingly scarcely sufficient to entertain so many guests. But though at home he was courted by the good and feared by the bad, and matters been admirably arranged, yet there was not wanting individuals who gave him great annoyance. These disputes we will explain in order, that posterity may have a singular example of fortitude, which each may imitate according to his ability. To resume our narrative, as soon as he returned to the city, calling to mind the saying of Matthew 6.33, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and on all other things will be added unto you. The first he did was to obtain the consent of the Senate to form of ecclesiastical polity, which was agreeable to the word of God, and from which neither ministers nor people should afterwards be permitted to depart. The form which had been formally approved was hated by some among the common people and renounced by the Pope, had assumed the name of Christ in name only. Some of the ministers who had remained in the city when these good men were driven out, driven out of it, the chief of them indeed being afterwards accused of flagrant misconduct, had basely deserted their posts although they did not dare to resist the testimony of their conscience, yet secretly opposed it, not easily allowing themselves to be reduced into order. Nor did they want a pretext for their malice, the example of other churches in which there was no excommunication. In short, there were not wanting some who cried out that a popish tyranny was re-established. But Calvin's firmness, combined with his singular moderation, overcame these difficulties. 
He demonstrated that not only doctrines, but also the form of church government must be sought for in Scripture, and appealed, in support of his views, to the expressed opinion of the most distinguished men of his age, his Ecolampadius, Zwinglius, Zicius, Philip, Bucer, Capito, and Myconius, still not condemning as anti-Christian those churches which had not proceeded the same length, or those pastors who thought that their flocks did not require to be so curbed. In fine, he demonstrated how great the difference was between popish tyranny and the yoke of the Lord. In this way, he was successful in getting those laws of ecclesiastical polity, which the church still observes, to be drawn up with the universal consent, read over, and finally approved by the suffrages of the people on the 20th of November. Although these things had been happily begun, yet as Calvin perceived that they could not be carried into practice without considerable difficulty, he felt exceedingly desirous that Viret, whom the Bernese had only parted with for a time, and Farrell, whom the inhabitants of Neufchantel had received on his ejection, should be appointed his perpetual colleagues. In this, however, he did not succeed. Viret, having, Viret, having shortly after returned to Lausanne, and Farrell again fixed his residence at Neuchâtel. Hence, the merit of restoring the Genevan church is almost entirely due to Calvin alone. In the following year, 1542, Calvin had no few sources of annoyance. For, in addition to those which he had at home, the inflamed fury of his enemies of the gospel, expelling numbers of persons from France and Italy, and bringing them into a neighboring city of so much celebrity. It is a wonderful, or rather it is wonderful, with what zeal he exerted himself to counsel and refresh the exiles, by every kind of attention, to say nothing of the letters which he wrote for the consolation of those who continued in the very lion's jaws. The same year, two very grievous evils were added, vis-à-vis -a, -vis a scarcity of corn and its usual, attendance, or usual attendant, the plague. Scarcity of corn and the plague. At that time, the custom in Geneva was to send those suffering by the plague to a hospital outside the city. But as the assistance of steady and careful pastor was required, and the greater part declined from fear of infection, three volunteered themselves. It's Calvin, Sebastian Castello, of whom we will afterwards speak, and Peter Blanchet. Lots were cast. Interesting. But when the lot fell upon Castello, he changed his mind huh, and impudently declined to undertake the office. Calvin wished to do it, but the Senate interposing to prevent him, Blanchet, who still volunteered, was appointed. Other grievous evils also occurred at this time, for Peter Toussaint, a pastor of Montebelliard, revived the controversy concerning the Lord's Supper, of course. While at Basil, there was not wanting persons who, notwithstanding of the opposition of Myconius, sought to overthrow the foundations of ecclesiastical discipline before they were well laid. Two conferences were held with Calvin on the subject. At Metz, where Farrell, who had been invited thither, was laboring with great success, the work of the Lord was greatly impeded, partly by the apostate Peter Caroli, whom we have already mentioned. How much Calvin labored on these occasions by writing, admonishing, exhorting, etc., may be understood from his published letters and is also attested by many in manuscript. But the Sorbonne, growing more audacious, than they had ever been before, in consequence of the patronage of Peter Lyser, or Lyser perhaps, president of the Parliament of Paris, a man whose memory is still in detestation, ventured on an attempt at which the bishops, or at least the Pope himself, would scarcely have con connived had they not been occupied in dividing the spoils of the church among themselves in the manner in which robbers are wont to do, and so leaving their own special duty of administering in the word administering the word to be performed by those worthies whom they called doctors. On the same terms, however, in which dogs serve their masters, the being permitted to gnaw the bones which come from the table, after they exceedingly well picked, the Sorbonne, then supported by no authority, human or divine, had dared to prescribe articles of Christian faith of such a kind that both by their falsehood and by their extreme childish, childness, childishness, so common to that body, they must have lost all authority with men not utterly devoid of sense. Many, however, came forward to subscribe themselves through fear and others through ignorance. Calvin, therefore, wrote, to an, ans wrote an answer in which, with great learning and solid argument, he refuted their errors and wittily exposed in their folly the derision of all 
that are not absolutely stupid. That's also in this uh, volume as well, which makes Beza's uh, biography uh, an appropriate beginning to this uh, volume series. And Ridley exposed the folly to derision of the not all that were absolutely stupid. In this <clears throat> manner, that year passed away, and the next, which was 1543, was in no respects of a milder nature. The same evils, that is, scarcity of corn and the plague, raging in Savoy, Calvin again exerted himself at home in confirming, confirming his people and abroad in strenuously opposing the enemies of the church. That he did, especially by the publication of four books on the controversy relating to free will. These, which he dedicated to Philip Melanchthon, were in answer to Albert Bigius uh, of Campen, who was the first sophist of the age and had selected Calvin for an antagonist in the hope that by gaining a distinguished victory he might obtain a cardinal's hat from the Pope. But his labor proved vain. The only thing he obtained was just what the enemy of the truth deserved. He, ex he excited the disgust of all men, of sense and learning, and was deceived by Satan himself. Philip Melanchthon, he declared, how high a value he set upon these books by his letter, which we thought it right to publish in order that posterity might have a sure and clear testimony with which to refute the calumniators of both. <clears throat> From a letter which Calvin himself addressed in many, in rather the same year to the church of Montebelliard, any person may know what answer to give to those who complain of his excessive severity in enforcing the laws of ecclesiastical polity. The following year was 1544, in course of which Calvin explained his opinion of the course pursued by, by the people of Neuf, Neufchâtel in the manner of ecclesiastical censures. But at home, Sebastian Castello, to whose levity we have already adverted, and who, though he had an air of mock humility, he had an air of mock humility, yet from his most absurd ambition, plainly belonged to the class of people whom the Greeks call there's a word here, I don't know what it is because it's written in Greek, but it's uh, wise in their own conceit, is the notation, being filled with indignation because Calvin had not approved of its silliness in the French translation of the New Testament, of revest to such a degree that, not contented with teaching certain strange doctrines, he publicly insisted that Solomon's song should be expunged from the canyon and is impure and obscene. When ministers refuted to comply, he assailed them with a bitterness reproach. Justly thinking that such conduct was not to be borne, they called him before the Senate on the 30th of June, when after a most patient hearing and full discussion, he was convicted of calumny and ordered to quit the city. How he conducted himself after going to Basel, where he was at length admitted, will be described elsewhere. The year before Charles V, having in the view of turning all his strength against the French, promised the Germans that for a short period until a general council were held, which he engaged to see done, neither party should suffer, prejudice on account of religious differences, but both enjoy equal laws. The Roman pontiff, Paul III, was exceedingly offended and addressed a very sev severe expostulation to the emperor because, forsooth, he had put heretics on a footing with Catholics and, as it were, put his sickle into another man's corn. Caesar gave what answer seemed proper, but Calvin, because the truth of the gospel and the innocence of the godly was deeply injured by the letter, repressed the audacity of the pontiff. A diet of the empire was at this time held at Spires, and Calvin availed himself of the occasion, published a short treatise on the necessity of reforming the church, also included in this volume. I know that if anything written on the subject, more nervous or solid, had been published in our age, the same year Calvin in two short treatises so effectively refuted both the Anabaptists and the Libertines, in whom all the most monstrous heresies of ancient times were renewed. That I believe no one who reads them attentively will ever be deceived by these people unless it will be with both eyes, unless it be with his eyes open or if he have been deceived, will not forthwith return to the right path. <clears throat> The treatise against the Libertines, however, gave offense to the Queen of Navarre, because the thing is almost incredible. She had been fascinated to such a degree by two ringleaders of that horrible sect, that is, uh, Quintin and Poquet, or Poquet, yes, perhaps, on whom Calvin had expressly uh, 
animad, animadverted, I do not know that word, Calvin had expressly animadverted that although she did not embrace their heresy, she held them to be good men and therefore thought herself in a manner stabbed through their side. When Calvin understood this, he replied to her with admirable moderation, as became her rank, and he and the remembrance of the benefits which she had conferred upon the Church of Christ, and yet ingenuously and frankly as became a faithful servant of God, censoring her imprudence in receiving men of such a character, and asserted the authority of his ministry. In short, it was owing to him that the professors of this horrid sect of libertines, who had begun to spread as far as France, afterwards kept within the confines of Holland and the adjacent provinces. While Calvin was worn out with all the labors of this year, the following year, 1545, commenced with contests, and these by far the most grievous in which he had been involved. For as if the plague sent from heaven had not sufficiently exhausted the city and its neighborhood, avarice prevailed to such a degree in some poor wretches whom the richer class had employed to take care of the sick and purify their houses, that having entered into a horrid conspiracy together, they besmeared the doorposts and thresholds, and all the passages of houses, with a pestilential ointment, which immediately produced a dreadful plague. How bizarre. They had come under a solemn oath to each other to become the bond slaves of Satan, in their event being induced by any tortures to betray their accomplices. Not a few, however, were apprehended as well in the city as in the neighboring districts, and suffered condign punishment. It is almost incredible how much uh, Satan by this device brought upon Geneva, and especially on Calvin, people believing that the arch enemy was obviously reigning in the very place where, in truth, he was most powerfully opposed. This year was almost, this year was also rather infamous for that salvage butchery which the Parliament of I committed on the Waldensian brethren of Merendal and Cabrier, and the whole of that district. Not on one or two individuals, but on the whole population, without distinction of age or sex, burning down their villages also. These calamities affected Calvin the more deeply, when consoling and refreshing, a few had taken refuge in Geneva, because he had formerly taken care by letters, and by supplying them with pastors, to have them purely instructed in the gospel. And when they had been brought into jeopardy on a former occasion, had saved them by interceding for them with the princes of Germany and the Swiss cantons. At this time also, that unhappy dispute concerning the Lord's Supper against, again, once again, the Lord's Supper, crept in. Osiander, a man of haughty and extravagant temper, stirring up the smothered embers. Osiander, I believe he was Lutheran. It is certainly, or it is certainly, was not Calvin's fault that this fire was not extinguished. In proof of this, we have published several of these letters which he wrote to Melanchthon. But the intemperance of that man, who both Calvin and Melanchthon surnamed Pericles, left no room for their sound advice. Meanwhile, the plague, raging in the city, carried off many good men. Calvin did his utmost in thundering from the pulpit against the flagitious lives of certain individuals, and especially against their whoredom, from which they could not even themselves desist. In this, all good men concurred with him, that is Calvin, though that there were some Denagogues who resisted his attempts until such time as they brought ruin upon themselves in these in the manner which will be explained in its own place. To these evils were added unseasonable disputes concerning the rights of citizenship. There were also disputes concerning the ecclesiastical revenues which had been carried off by the papists, and which the faithful pastors could not allow to be administered so improperly as they were in many places. These disputes occasioned much noise much complaint, much labor in speaking and writing, but generally to no purpose. Calvin, openly declaring that he certainly had not the least favor for the numerous acts of sacrilege, which he felt assured the heaven would one day punish most severely, by declaring also that he acknowledged the just judgment of God in not allowing the revenues, which formerly had been so iniquitously acquired by the priesthood, to be brought into the treasury of the church. We'll pause there for today.